Erev Tov, Chabrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. You know, the other night uh, when we did our broadcast, you may not have realized it when I was actually doing the broadcast, but it was during that broadcast that the Lord had actually revealed to me this startling revelation there in Ezekiel chapter 35 that the third intifada was actually prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel. Very startling revelation for me, even as I was doing the broadcast there, but it was so much of an interest to me that I actually had to come back to this once again tonight to put the emphasis on this very prophecy because it clearly identifies the hour and the age that we are living in when we look at the prophecy of Ezekiel and clearly see the intifada is definitely prophesied by this biblical prophet Ezekiel. Let's move on right into this and we'll look at that again. Ezekiel chapter 35 verse 5 it says, Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity. Now keep in mind this is regarding Esau or Edom. The descendants of Adam, that is. Now, there's two folds in this. When it speaks here, uh, you have, he has shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity. That was 70 A.D., as we see in Obadiah. Also, Daniel, who clearly prophesies of the prince that shall come, would be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Now, if you'll notice, the prince that shall come is of the people that destroy the temple and the sanctuary. Titus, the Roman general, is certainly the one that is given credit for destroying the temple and the sanctuary. And that's kind of evident there by the Ark of Titus there. I was actually in Rome quite a, several months back, and in behind me there, as you can see, the Ark of Titus there, uh, a closer up image that we took ourselves as well there. And this is where Obadiah carried the tre uh, excuse me, Titus carried those treasures back from uh, the temple from the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, according to Obadiah 1.11, says, In the day that thou didst stand aloof, in the day that strangers carried away his substance. Remember, remember Daniel chapter 9 clearly identifies that the one that would, dis, that would be the prince that shall come, now that's the future date, speaking of the Antichrist in the last days, would be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which was Titus the Roman general. Many scholars say that Titus and the Romans were really not the main ones that destroyed the temple. It was the Syrian soldiers. Well, Obadiah agrees with that as well when he states here, Thou didst stand aloof. In other words, you weren't really fully in the battle, but you were there anyway in the day that strangers carried away his substance. And foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou wast one of them. So God, through the prophet Obadiah, indicts the Romans as being two parts here. One, the descendants of Esau, as well as fully guilty and complicit, even though, yes, the Syrians would did the bulk of the battle. And as I said, that prince that shall come would be of the same people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which Obadiah clearly identifies <clears throat> as Esau's descendants. Now, Looking at a couple of other verses here in Obadiah, just so you would know what we're speaking about. In verse 6, how is Esau searched out? How are his hidden places sought out? This is to clearly identify that, yes, it is Esau. It is his descendants, just as we see in Daniel chapter 9, when it speaks about the prince that shall come, that Antichrist. He's not the Mashiach. He is just a prince. 
the one that claims to take the place of Christ, which is exactly what the Catholic Church claims. And again, verse 10, For the violence done to thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In that day that thou didst stand aloof, in the day that strangers carried away his substance, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Now, let's go a little deeper into this because we're going to go back to Ezekiel's prophecy here in just a moment, but I want to share with you a very interesting verse in uh, 24 in J Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to forgive iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal vi the vision and prophet and to anoint the most holy. Now remember what Ezekiel said in 35, verse 5, because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and has shed the blood of the children of Israel by force of the sword in the time of their calamity, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and the dispersal of the children of Israel at that time. But notice the next part, in the time that their iniquity had an end time that their iniquity had an end. According to Daniel 9.24, that iniquity has an end, the sin, to make an end of sin and to forgive the iniquity there. That happens in the 70 weeks of Daniel. It actually happens in that last week of the 70th week of Daniel is when that takes place. But what's fascinating is the fact that the prophet says that Esau, those descendants of Esau, the Romans, in other words, are throwing the, 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 the children of Israel to the sword. They were thrown to the sword at the time of the sword of the Titus, the Roman general, and his Syrian soldiers. And in the days that we're living in now, it's no different. Rome is still unified with the Arab nations surrounding Israel and still using the Arabs in order to bring the sword against the children of Israel. And in fact, the first and second intifada, it was fought with guns. In fact, 1948, the Independence War, fought with guns. In 1967, fought with guns. The 73 war, fought with guns and bombs and intifada with suicide bombers. But ironically, the third intifada begins with with, a, with a, a wild, raging Arabic Palestinians raging with their swords, their knives, stabbing and killing the Jews. Why? Why was the weapon of the knife chosen? Some might say, well, they wanted to strike fear into the Israelis. But see, the prophet Ezekiel had prophesied that they would be thrown to the sword. And of course, we could say that the bullets and stuff is still a type of that. But God wanted to let you know when the time came that their iniquity had an end, when their sin would have an end, according to Daniel chapter 9, 24, that we are seeing the very time frame and when the two witnesses will arrive to reveal to them their Messiah, who Mashiach really is, according to my Jewish brethren, the time of Eliyahu, Elijah the prophet coming, according to um, uh, one of the great uh, biblical scholars of, of the Jew Jewish people there, uh, Rashi, stated that even Moses would return in the Messianic age. To fulfill those prophecy of, De of Exodus chapter 15, where he says, I will sing unto the Lord that he's gotten victory over the horse and his rider, and he has been hurled into the sea. That's that prince that shall come, the Antichrist spirit, to say the least there. Let's kind of look at a few other things I wanted to share with you that I thought was interesting. If we go back and look at how this is kind of built up, just kind of a little fast pace here. Kerry sets a nine-month goal for Mideast peace talks. This was reported by CBS News on July 30th, 2013. When this first came out, we went and spoke about this publicly ourselves, and we noted that Rebecca's prophecy of the two-state solution was actually being uh, fulfilled in this nine-month negotiation that John Kerry set up there. Genesis 25, 23, you know, this is when Rebecca goes before the Lord, and she's asking the Lord, why am I thus? 
us. And this was the Lord's was answered to her. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. Isn't that fascinating? Esau and Jacob was the, were these two children. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now, some people might think that the nine-month negotiation here has something to do with the two-state solution regarding Israel and the Palestinians. But in reality, according to what really went on, the two-state deal is between the Vatican. The negotiation was between the Vatican and Israel. This is the true Esau and Jacob. But of course, Daniel chapter 11 says that after that, uh, not covenant year, but after the, um, uh, what was the word that was used in there? There was a, uh, they, they signed an agreement there in Daniel chapter 11, but then it says that they would come up strong with a small people. See, that, that particular uh, agreement that was signed was signed with the, uh, with the Jewish Congress, and now the Vatican is rapidly gaining uh, victory through the Palestinian people. But truly, it is Esau and Jacob where this nine-month negotiations is. But, of course, the Vatican, to ensure that the Palestinians get what they would like, they're going to throw in that nice little two-state deal in there for them. And uh, that's exactly what does happen later down the road. The Vatican recognized Palestinian state in new treaty according to the New York Times, on May the 13th, 2015. And as we know, it was implemented into full effect uh, just recently here in January of 2016. So the two-state deal has already been done. It's already been signed. Everybody's looking for a seven-year covenant, but it's not. that's not what we're looking at here. The covenant has been signed. That Esau and Jacob, Rome and uh, Israel, have made the agreement, and the Vatican has been able to get Mount Zion, and they're getting many other things that they've wanted all along. According to Giulio Miotti's article, I've, I've quoted this to you guys many times, the Vatican wants to lay its hands on Jerusalem. Peace negotiations in the Middle East must tackle the issue of the status of the holy sites of Jerusalem. Cardinal, Cardinal Jean-Louis Toran, head of the Vatican's Council for Interreligious Dialogue, declared several days ago in Rome. Now, this was back in 2011, but he also reiterated the exact same words in 2015. All right, now, not long after this was issued in December on the 15th, on the 18th, if you guys remember, in a recent uh, news broadcast that we brought out about Hillary Clinton's secret emails being revealed uh, during this investigation that's going on about Benghazi, we find out that Hillary Clinton's aides were encouraging her on the 18th of December of 2011 to, uh, to cause a protest among the Arabic women in, uh, of the Palestinians to get the Jews forced back to the negotiating table. So it's kind of odd that the that Tehran states this, uh, or states these comments in here about the holy sites coming under their control, and then a few days later, Hillary Clinton is being egged on by her aides in order to start protest by the Palestinians. Let's read on. The Vatican's former foreign minister asked to place some Israeli holy places under Vatican authority, alluding to the uh, cynical of the Mount Zion and Garden of Gethsemane at the foot of the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. The first uh, also houses wh what is referred to as King David's tomb. Now, this is what Tehran says here. This is the critical statement that he stated here then in 2011 and he has well stated again here in 2015 just recently there will be no not excuse me there will not be peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved this is what Tehran said there will not be peace now why would there not be peace if they don't adequately resolve the issue of the holy sites for the catholic church well, you don't see any of the priests out there wielding a bunch of knives and stabbing the Jews. But nonetheless, according to the biblical prophecy of Ezekiel 35, it is Esau that is put to the blame of the sword in his hand against his brother Jacob. Remember, he comes up strong with a small people, according to Daniel chapter 11. That's the Palestinians. 
In Rome, just like the United States and Russia and many other nations always use other nations to fight their battles, well, Esau, Rome in this case, just as he did back during the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, was using the Syrian military in order to be able to destroy Rome or destroy Israel and do his dirty work for him. The Vatican is still doing the same thing today. Cardinal Tehran said, there will not be peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved. And so what has he done? Just like his forefather, Titus, the Roman general, he has contracted the Jordanian, so-called Palestinian Arabs to wage war against Israel with the sword, just as the prophecy of Ezekiel 35 is actually stated. Anyway, the part, of, uh, the part of the Jerusalem with the walls, with the holy uh, sites of the three religions as humanity's heritage, the sacred and the unique character of the area must be safeguarded, and it can only be done with a special international guaranteed statute. Another thing Turan stated there. Unbelievable. Anyway, something else I wanted to bring up to you uh, in this article, the Israeli government and the Vatican are deadlocked in discussions over the status of the religious sites. The Vatican officials are now reiterating their demand for control over the religious sites in the ancient holy city founded by King David as the capital of ancient Israel and now the capital of re-established Jewish state. Danny Ayalon. Israel's deputy foreign minister declared that Israel might consider giving the Vatican a greater role in operating uh, the sites. In the last weeks, the Roman Catholic Church Authority increased their political initiatives for Catholic control over some sites in Jerusalem. Why is Danny Ayalon siding with the Vatican, knowing that Rome is Israel's greatest enemy. Esau is, many Jews, many Orthodox Jews call them Esau. Well, very interesting to say the least there. Israel and the Vatican on the verge of a historic agreement, uh, agreement here. This was printed on January 31st, 2013. And my apology, I meant to put the, uh, okay, I believe, okay, it looks like it was on Israel Hayom. Uh, was the, was where it was published at. I, I, I thought I had put it in the, Headline there, but I forgot to do that. I apologize for that. Anyway, one of the most contentious areas was dispute over the cynical. The tra traditional site of Jesus' Last Supper on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, according to the agreement, Israel did not give up sovereignty over it, but will allow the Vatican control over the site, Israel Hayom reported. Now, the thing is, they did give up Mount Zion. And they do have, the Vatican does have full control, as it was shown by the fact that one, which I would have not have had a problem with the Vatican doing a communion in the upper room, but a week or so later, the Catholic Church came in there and held a communion service inside King David's tomb and threw all of the Jews out of the tomb using Israeli special forces to do so. I tried to do an interview there with the rabbi there that's over the temple, uh, King David's tomb there. Uh, they were afraid to speak to me on camera because of the tensions over the Vatican's control of Mount Zion. Very interesting to say the least. This agreement is real upgrade in relations between Israel and the Holy See and between the Jewish people and the one billion Catholics around the world to benefit both sides, Ayalon added. Well, isn't that nice? Mr. Ayalon, why are, are you a traitor to the Jewish people? Why have you sold out to the Catholic Church? Well, this may explain it all right here. Mr. Ayalon married uh, this young woman here, his wife, Anne, both Daniel Ayon and his wife, Anne, are intimately involved with the evangelical and Catholic communities and have com comfortably appeared on missionary television and has a significant business and real estate dealings with the Christian community and was listed as the talking head for the Pope's visit on Christian-Israeli relations. In a pamphlet put out by the Israel Project TIP, at the time of Pope Benedict the 16th visit in May of 2009. I guess that explains a lot of it right there. If you got business with the church, you're going to do what the church says or else. So, as we stated here though, Tehran said there will be no peace unless everything is resolved adequately. I guess there's not, everything's not necessarily been resolved quite as adequately as thought. 
No wonder why the prophet Ezekiel said that Esau was throwing his brother to the sword. Not only at the time of their calamity when Esau used the Arabic nations to come and destroy Israel as well as their temple, but also in the time of their iniquity that it had an end. According to even not only Ezekiel's prophecy of 35.5, but also of Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. The time that their iniquity has an end is about to be upon us. According to the prophet Ezekiel, when we saw that the Jews would be attacked by the sword, and of course I have clearly shown you through Cardinal Turan's own statement that there will be no peace in Jerusalem if the holy sites are not adequately answered. Esau's history has always been to use the Arabic nations surrounding Israel to do their dirty work. Just as we see in the case now, the Palestinians are doing the bidding of the Vatican. They're in there, attacking the Jews by the edge of the sword, clearly identifying to us by the prophet Ezekiel that we are at the time when Israel's iniquity will have an end. It is time for the two witnesses to come on the scene. It is a time that Israel recognize her Messiah. And of course, when they come on the scene, judgment will come on Rome. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment in a very serious hour that we're living in. Shalom and good evening.